Oh. And, uh, and um, she, she's, just, she's a wonderful, wonderful speaker. And she's done some travel type things for us. And now she's going to do this series on extinct animals, extinct species. And so um, Jerry, thank you again for coming. And Nancy and Pat, thanks very much for coming too. Yeah, thank you so much for coming tonight. And you know, it is, for me, it's never about the size of an audience. It's about how engaged you are. And I just love that you're here tonight because this is a topic that is so important. Of course, it's important. But it's also something that is like so embedded in my heart. It's an, um, a topic of extinct species, not just the dodo, but extinct species in general have just captivated me, probably since I was a child. And um, it's kind of interesting how I developed this program. Uh, they've always been in the back of my mind, but it took something almost catastrophic, well, it was catastrophic anyway. I almost died, but it was during this period of recovery that I started working on developing the series on extinct species. So you hear about the person that put me into the rabbit hole and sent me off developing this thing. So we're going to begin with the dodo bird um, this evening. We have no pictures of the dodo. I mean, no photographs of the dodo. He um, became extinct many, many years before photography uh, was invented, but it's been, this animal's been extinct for about 350 years but so little is known about it. And it lived during a time of written history, um, but it's known, um, little, little is known about it. We know more about dinosaurs actually than we do dodo birds. That's just incredible. Uh, it was very difficult painting a true picture of this bird based on ship's logs and artistic interpretation. Its appearance, its life history, the history of its extinction remain a little bit sketchy quite a bit sketchy in some, in some cases. And there was a time when the very existence of the dodo bird was questioned. Like, come on, this thing never really existed, did it? Did it really? But now it really is the poster child for all extinct species. So we have to begin first with a person who sent me down the rabbit hole. His name is Errol Fuller. He is first and foremost an artist. And um, not only is Errol an artist, he, is the the, he owns the largest collection of Victorian taxidermy in the world. And he also happens to be the world's expert on extinct species. So I was extremely sick in 2015 and bedridden for months. And um, I started uh, reading about extinct species for whatever reason. And I'm in this macabre state, so why don't I read about dead things? <laughs> and so I came upon this man's books, Errol Fuller, and I was flipping. I was pressing the Amazon.com order <laughs> all night long. And I amassed, oh, let's see, every single one of these books I own. Uh, and I have a couple more because I love Errol because he's first and foremost an artist, and then he is a scientist. So when you buy one of his books, it's written for people like me, a layman. He's an artist, so they're beautifully laid out, and they're easy to understand. And I am totally in love with this man. So a um, friend of mine said, why don't you write him a fan mail? Why don't you write him an email? And it's like, nah, 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 nah. And she goes, no, no, write him, write him, because, you know, these people love this kind of stuff. So I just let him know how important he was to me. And I'm not even kidding you, in less than a day, I heard back from Errol Fuller. And it started this wonderful exchange of letters. He was like my pen pal during, um, during this period when I was sick for months. And after that, our friendship continued. So uh, in, I think it was 2017, I asked him to write a, a cover story for White Memorial's quarterly newsletter, Sanctuary, about the significance of taxidermy. And he couldn't have been more accommodating. He is the nicest man. And again, I cannot recommend him more highly. His books are just beyond belief. And it's because of Errol, really, that I started this series. Um, so I dedicate all of my, my work uh, to him. So there was considerable confusion about the origin of the English uh, common name, Dodo. 
In the 17th century, there were a variety of names used in publications about Mauritius, and this is the place where the dodo came from. There was only one place on Earth. This is what's so bad about extinct species. If there's only one place on Earth where these animals live, they are so susceptible to human tampering. The dodo, the thylacine, and even the passenger pigeon that was only on the North American continent. Um, and the great auk, Amazing. All of these animals all had very, very small areas of distribution. So mostly the, the words of, about the dodo came from Dutch accounts, but the Portuguese had discovered Mauritius in 1507. And they didn't publish any materials because they considered these trade routes, you know, this was a big deal and they didn't want anybody to know about their trade routes. But the Dutch published descriptions of their voyages and they were widely translated and they generated great interest. So the Mascarene Islands had been discovered and settled by the Portuguese in the 16th century. Arab traders had already visited, but they didn't settle there. They didn't see anything that they really wanted. And there were no mammals on the island at all. The islands were dominated by birds that had evolved to fill in the niches that were occupied elsewhere by mammals. So Mauritius had been discovered around 1500 by the Portuguese seeking a route for the East, out to the East Indies. And they named it the Island of Swans, suggesting that they had sighted a dodo and mistaken it for a swan. The dodo was a pretty decent sized bird. Um, it's never been inhabited, it was never inhabited by man. And the Dutch named it after their prince, Moritz of Nassau. And both countries were building colonial empires, but politics between Portugal and Spain and the Netherlands meant the Dutch East India Company was the first to establish a foothold in Mauritius. And um, in addition to finding a, it as a useful stopover, uh, they logged the abundant ebony and released pigs to ensure a living larder. And you know, that's what happens when you start doing things like that. You're, you're just defoliating the country. And then all of a sudden you're releasing pigs that aren't indigenous and they dig and blah, blah, blah. You know where we're going with this. In 1598, a large Dutch expedition to the East Indies from the Netherlands, um, commanded by a Jacob Cornelissoon van Neck, ran into bad weather off the Cape of Good Hope. And five of the ships sailed east of Madagascar and running out of food and water, they landed on this Islo do Cerne, the island of swans. And um, sloops from the Amster Amsterdam Gelderland discovered a natural harbor, and they called it Warwick Harbor after the Amsterdam's vice admiral. Um, so this was a beautiful tropical island full of palm trees, ebony forest. It was inhabited by pigeons, parrots, and this strange, weird looking flightless bird. None of the wildlife showed any fear of them. They'd never seen people before. And um, the birds were very docile, and of course, that meant they were very easy prey. Here, these people, they were shipwrecked, they're starving, and off they go. So even though this large bird had a hooked beak, um, that the hooked beak was really dangerous to them. They could grab that bird, but they had to be very careful because the bill of the dodo was really, really large. So they called the large bird a kermis goose since the harbor was found on the date of the annual Kermis Fair in Amsterdam. And they described them as big as swans with large heads and on the head a veil as though they had a small hood on their head. They had no wings, but in their place there were three or four black quills. And where there ought to be a tail, there were four or five small curled plumes of a grayish color. Um, they said for all its size, the only edible part was the breast and there wasn't that much of it. So imagine, here's a bird the size of a turkey or a swan and no breast meat, nothing. So there really wasn't that much. And yet other people said that they'd seen them, they were really fat and they were plump. The stomach was good eating, they said. However, much of this, the, they stewed the rest of the bird and it was tough and sinewy, oily and bad tasting, hence the name nauseating bird for a, a, a wog vogel. So like a turkey, this strange bird stored fat in its rump, earning another Dutch name, dodar, which means fat arse. And they later rendered, uh, that was later rendered down to dodo. So they turned their attention from the kermis goose to the much tastier pigeons. 
And despite the fact that this bird was really poor eating within 75 years of it, the discovery of Mauritius and um, this bird, the, the, the dodo was extinct in 75 years. And this always seems to be the case in like less than 100 years, entire population species gone. So sluggard, nauseous bird, foolish, stupid, disgusting bird, fatter, swollen, crazy, wallow bird, small, small wing. This poor animal got no respect from day one. Um, this is a 1628 painting by Roland Savary, and it's called Landscape with Birds, and there's our dodo down there. Very kind of fanciful and allegorical. So there is Mauritius. Um, the bird, again, was exclusive to this island, 500 miles east of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. It's also a part of a, an archipelago with Reunion, Rodriguez, Mauritius, that's the Mascarene Islands. Um, it was once very volcanic and less than 10 million, 10, 10 million years old, so it's very new land. The population today is 1.3 million, with the size of the island a bit smaller than Rhode Island, or 11 times the size of Washington, D.C. So a tiny little island, 1.3 million people. Well, think about that. In Connecticut, we've got 3 million people that live here. So a very, very tiny island. And a beautiful one. I'd love to go there. This is a 1601 engraving that shows Dutch activities on the shores of Mauritius. Um, and it's the first published etching of the, or photo of the dodo bird, which is just, obviously greatly exaggerated. Look at the size of the turtles. And it, it shows that little knot on their bums. Just looking at some of my notes here. Yeah, it, it, they just, they said the name of Dodo, another reason they could, they thought the, the name Dodo came about was because it was a, um, they were trying to replicate the what it sounded like, which was doo doo. Apparently, it, they're related to pigeons, believe it or not. They're huge pigeons, but they're related to pigeons and pigeons coo. And a, from written records, it sounded like maybe they were saying doo doo. Doo 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 doo. Woo woo. No, that's an owl, Jerry. So, bats are the only mammals, yay, we love bats, that are native to Mauritius. Rats, cats, monkeys, deer, pigs, mongooses, and other mammals were all introduced to the island. Uh, the management of introduced mammal species is an ongoing challenge in conservation around the world. Um, and, and they often eat or compete with native and endemic species. I love down in the lower right, a dugong is what it is. It's like a, a sea manatee. And I, up until the point when I was uh, researching this program, I never even had heard of them, shame on me. But, uh, but again, whenever you bring people in to colonize a place, they will bring in invasive plants, they will bring in invasive animals, and they will gravely impact the delicate habitat for the native creatures that are living there. Here's the flag of Mauritius. The meaning of the flags are both historically rooted and based on contemporary usage. So um, Mauritius was long under colonial rule by the British and the French, and the national flag reflects the unique culture of the nation. It was chosen in anticipation of independence from colonial rule, and that happened on March 12, 1968. For me, that's fairly recent. It also is the date that the first flag was hoisted. Um, before gaining into independence, Mauritius displayed a typical colonial flag of the British Empire. Um, but the current flag of Mauritius was adopted upon its independence. It has four equal horizontal stripes and is nicknamed four bands. The four bands are red, blue, yellow, and green. And each color on the flag has a meaningful representation of the country. The red is for the bloodshed, uh, independence, and freedom. The blue for the Indian Ocean. Uh, the yellow for the light of independence shining over the nation. And the green for the agriculture and lush vegetation of the nation based on its subtropical weather. And it is a paradise. Their coat of arms, look who's on it. D designed in 1906. Um, 
The shift in the first quarter refers to the European settlers of the island, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, the English. The second quarter shows three palm trees for the tropical vegetation and the three dependencies of Mauritius, the Carcarados, the Agalaga Islands, and the Rodriguez Islands, all in the archipelago. The key symbolize the strategic importance of the island, and the fourth quarter shows the island as the star of the Indian Ocean. The supporters are the extinct dodo and a somber deer, symbolizing the extinct and present wildlife of the island. The two green sugar canes indicate the importance of sugar to the local economy, and their motto means the star and key of the Indian Ocean. You know, of course, even though this animal's been gone for close to 400 years, it's still very prevalent on postage stamps. In 1997, um, there was a commemorative stamp. George Clark, the English-born schoolmaster, uh, became famous for laying claim to discovering the first set of dodo bo bones on the island, and that was in 1866. So that's the um, the stamp on the upper upper left, and, and yet there's so little left of these animals. There isn't one complete skeleton, I think, anywhere in the world. And even on their their um, money, their currency, we'll be talking about this specific piece coming up. It's just everywhere. So famous and gone for so long. It's just such an icon. Their coins. But here was the habitat of the dodo bird, this absolutely exquisite island. It's all, of course, about tourism today. Absolutely gorgeous swaying palm trees, beautiful blue ocean, incredible coral reefs white sand beaches, but remember, it was once a very volcanic island, so that's all, all lava there. It just looks like paradise. But this place is incredible. It's called the Terrace de Sept Couleurs, the, um, the uh, land of seven colors in the original French, and it's a rare geological oddity that proves brown is far from the only color of dirt. Just spectacular. And some of the vegetation is unbelievably rare. This is known as Bois Dental. Um, it's a flowering tree known for its sprays of long white bell-shaped flowers. And it's from the delicate patterns of the flowers that the tree gets its name, uh, lacewood. The, the uh, trees are found high in the cloud forest and on Mauritius, and only on Mauritius, by the way. And it's, um, it's the only place that they're found because there are only two of them left in nature. So again, people came in, start cutting things down. I think they can be propagated indoors or in greenhouses, but again, in nature, only two of these trees are left. How fragile these environments are. Isn't that heavenly? I'd go there on a vacation. If it, the flight weren't 20,000 hours. Again, 1.3 million people on this tiny little island that was once occupied by flightless birds and you know some flying birds. And this is just a really neat thing I pulled off the internet of what it possibly looked like when dodos were feeding. And again, lots of ground cover. Um, I think that perhaps their bill was this large so that it could dig into the ground and get through all of that thick vegetation. So how he was constructed? It's kind of a clunky looking thing, but you'll be very surprised. He was bigger than a turkey, weighed about 50 pounds and stood about three feet tall. And it had a blue gray plumage, a big head, a nine inch blackish bill with a reddish sheath forming the hook tip, <clears throat> small useless wings, stout yellow legs and a tuft of curly feathers high on its rear end. I don't know whether it's surprising or unsurprising that we have so little to go on for an animal that died out almost 400 years ago, but the fact remains that relatively few people properly and accurately recorded the appearance of this bird um, while it was alive. I guess they were too busy, you know, I don't know, uh, trying to salvage their ships or, or whatever, because the bird was very prevalent on this island. 
So several authors said that the window during which people got to know the existence of the dodo before it was gone forever was extremely short. And that's true, it was discovered and then poof, it was gone in 75 years. So some European authors in the 1700s and 1800s doubted that even the bird even existed, which is what I said before. It had a squat posture, not indicative of how fast the bird moves or how it stands. Originally, um, it was declared a small ostrich, a rail or an albatross. But in 1842, a Danish zoologist named Theodor Reinhardt proposed that it was a ground pigeon based on its skull studies. And his idea was ridiculed. But in fact, the closest living relative of the dodo is this extraordinary pigeon, the Nicobar pigeon, closest relative. Um, this is native to the Solomon Islands in the Indian Ocean, South Pacific, Pacific and the, the Nicobar Islands. It's 16 inches in length and it's the only species of its genus left. So use as close as it gets to a dodo as we have just a stunning bird. This one is fairly closely related to, but not the same. It's a crown pigeon. And um, this is the largest species of pigeon. It contains four large species in its group um, that are endemic to the islands of New Guinea and a few surrounding islands. They're very similar to each other in its, its um, appearance. 31 inches long and seven and a half pounds. That is a big pigeon. Very pretty. So dodos, of course, couldn't fly, but they could definitely run. So their rather strange appearance, um, even though it was originally thought that they were clumsy and didn't move really well, they could move extremely fast. Um, there's a lack of scientific evidence from the time when dodos were uh, alive. Modern scientists believe they have managed to deduce the fact based on the dodo's skeletal structure and the size of its legs. So most of the pictures you see, it's all squat and all the legs are covered up under there. But when you look at some of the skeletal remains, they had really long legs. So they were capable of moving very quickly. Because the bird had no natural enemies, the females enjoyed the luxury of laying only one egg at a time. Most other birds lay multiple eggs, of course, in order to increase the odds at least one egg is going to hatch um, and you know, escaping predators or a natural disaster. Um, but pigeons, dodos were probably very competitive during the mating season and they were large and they needed a lot of food. So scientists believe that they probably um, were not very sociable. They didn't, they weren't in big groups and they may have been territorial to protect their favorite feeding areas. They probably established nesting territories as well and they bred in pairs rather than harems. And we know that they laid a single egg in a ground level nest, obviously. Um, they couldn't fly. Uh, being large birds, the chick would have developed really slowly, maybe taking nine months to reach maturity. And this means that a dodo probably only bred every two years and that pairs remain together to raise a single offspring. Once independent of its parents, the young may have formed groups. Uh, there was a French naturalist named Legault who wrote of creches of young in the upland forest. So when I see these pictures of dodos all together, I thought, oh, those must be young ones because they didn't believe that they had any kind of, uh, you know, big groups as they became adults. So with no predators to keep the population down and with finite food and territory, it benefited the dodo to breed very, very slowly. This is um, also an extinct species of Rodriguez solitaire, and it's a 1708 drawing by Francois Legault, the only illustration of the species by someone who observed it alive. And pigeons, by the way, are extremely intelligent birds, and the dodo has always been given a bad rap, and you're, you're always, you're, you're a dodo bird, you're stupid. But dodo was probably a very intelligent bird because pigeons are very, very intelligent birds, and dodo in Portuguese means stupid poor thing. So the dodo and the solitaire, and this is solitaire, um, both had enlarged olfactory bulbs, which is unusual for birds. Um, most birds can't smell at all. Birds can't count and birds can't smell except in a few cases. So 
it suggests that the dodo had an enhanced sense of smell and an adaptation that could have helped it sniff out food in that dense vegetation on a tropical um, forest floor. That looks like a complete skeleton. It very well could be. I don't know where I took this from, but pretty much an artist's rendition. Any of these um, things with feathers that you see will not be taxidermy specimens. They're all probably chicken feathers. And, uh, and again, what we have is some bones and very, very little else. So it's just an artist's interpretation of what the bird looked like, but it's probably pretty accurate. So a nine inch beak. The tip was used for defense and crushing seeds. And they believe that the tip of the bill fell off, shed every, shed every year. This is an 1848, um, who's the, published by Hugh Edwin Strickland and Alexander Melville, the dodo and its kindred. But this is so cool, the Oxford specimen. So no complete dodo specimens exist. It's external it, um, appearance, plumage, coloration is hard to determine. Illustrations and written accounts of the encounters with the dodo between its discovery and extinction, again, 1598 to 1662, that's it, are the primary evidence um, for the external appearance. So this is the Oxford dodo head. It's the most significant remaining piece of soft tissue evidence pertaining to the bird. It's amazing that it even exists to this day, honestly. Oh, so let me see if I can do this. Tell me if you see this, Nancy, when I start this up. Hold on. Let me pull this over here. Oh, geez. We, of course, we have to go to the commercial. Sorry about that. This is so cool. So this is the actual Oxford dodo skull. Oop. Well, we're going to... Well, we don't want to see the Nautilus, but that's okay. It was just a, a little... You know, stuff you find on the internet, I have to show it all. So this is an actual 3D look at the Oxford Dodo skull, which I find absolutely fascinating. The stuff you find on the internet, honest to God. Let me get this out of here before we get some YouTube, whatchamacallit. What's this one, Jerry? Oh, it's a 3D model. Okay. And again, the same skull. So the Oxford Dodo is the most iconic specimen held by Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and it's the only surviving soft Dodo tissue. Today, what remains of the original specimen is the skull with the left side. Whoops, what did I do? Or just, did it just go bye-bye? Okay. The left side of, um, you know, one of these days, Nancy, I'll get it straight with this technology. So what's left is, on the left side of its head is skin, um, the sclerotic ring from the eye, uh, the skeleton of the foot, the sectioned femur, a feather removed from its head in 1986 so that they could do some DNA stuff with it, and various tissue samples were taken over the years. The scan of the skull was made by uh, Professor Rob, Roger Benson and um, in May 2018 as part of a research project examining domestication in birds. I don't know if that, that's kind of odd. This is 1848 lithograph, the same specimen. They said males were larger and had proportionally longer beaks. And thanks to the British Museum, dodo foot, the original, was lost. Um, we have a good data on the look of this part of the body. So they, they actually had this foot, but somehow it disappeared. It's, maybe it's an Errol's collection, I'll have to ask. <laughs> this is from 1849. This is from Nat Geo. This is a slide of bone bits used to extract DNA at Oxford University. I have very weird feelings about this taking these animals and trying to bring them back, you know, with DNA. I mean, to me, it's almost um, 
something egotistical for a geneticist to be able to do this. And what we can never, this bird will never survive. It could never survive our modern, you know, our, the modern world. It can't, it's impossible. So what's the point? I don't know. I don't understand. I think it's more of our human ego. Oh, okay. So I was wrong. There are only two intact skeletons that exist. Other skeletons on display are built from different bits and bobs and also included reproductions, just like dinosaur bones. But look at the legs in this, um, just to show you how this bird was definitely capable of moving fast. Big, big legs. And it's funny too, for such a big bird, look at the breastbone, there's nothing to it. So when they were complaining that there was no breast meat, you didn't really have any. I took this picture in Paris um, at the Natural History Museum and they have an entire hall there dedicated to extinct species. And I'm telling you, when you go to Paris, Nancy, when we go to Paris, it can't be all about cafes. We have to go to this museum because leave it to the French who have cornered the market on love and beauty <laughs> they may not be the most organized people in the world. I don't care. Food, love, art, beauty, they've got it down. And in this exquisite natural history museum is one whole hall dedicated to extinct species. And when you walk in, it is the most powerful, one of the most powerful things. My girlfriend Liz and I went, we walked in the room, we just started crying because it's a room that's completely blackened except for spotlights on every single one of these extinct species. And it's just amazing. But it's interesting that outside of the room is where they have the little bits and bobs of the dodo. So I don't know why the dodo was put out there. Um, maybe because it is so important. It was really the first animal that kind of, it was that made us realize in you know kind of modern history uh, about the impact that humans make on other living things. So maybe he was out there for a reason, but he isn't, wasn't in the room with all the others. Unbelievably powerful, really, really powerful. So they believe that its ancestors blew to Mauritius in storms millions of years ago, and it had no predators, so it evolved into a flightless bird. And because this, its breast muscles were very small, but its butt muscles were quite big, <laughs> It was a ground nester, as we know now, and scientists speculate the lifespan was about 20 years. Males slightly larger than females. They say that um, there are lots of pictures that depict dodos as being really fat birds, but it could be two things. They could have been taken, paintings were of um, specimens that were in captivity. And also they believe that there were just periods during the year when there was more food available to the birds. So they fattened up and then there were other times when there wasn't enough food. There was a dry season. Went on a diet during the dry season. And this is just a reconstruction. This is again, I took this in Paris. I mean, he wasn't the prettiest thing, kind of cute. I wouldn't want to get nailed by that beak, let me tell you. So what did he eat? Ebony seeds, crabs and shellfish, many varieties of palm fruit and stones, similar to pigeons and turkeys, they would ingest stones, which helped grinding, uh, grind the coatings off of seeds. Um, there is a, a main portion of the diet was a tambalacoke, tambalacoke seeds from this tree of the same name or dodo tree. They called it the dodo tree. So this is what the tree looks like. So in the 1970s, there was concern that this tambalacoke tree was on the brink of extinction. There were supposedly only 13 specimens left, all estimated to be about 300 years old. And the true age couldn't be determined because like most tropical trees, um, they don't have any growth rings, which is something I didn't know about. So a scientist came up with a theory that the tree relied upon the dodo to complete its life cycle. Um, they thought that uh, before the tough seeds could germinate, they had to first pass through a digestive system of the dodo. 
And the idea was that the abrasion in the bird's gizzard and the stomach acids would start to break down the seed surface, allowing water to penetrate and triggering germination. So the extinction of the dodo in the 17th century due to hunting by people was linked um, to the absence of young trees. But really, the extinction of the dodo was preventing the Tambalacoque tree from regenerating, and the tree seemed doomed to go uh, you know, down, the, down the tubes. Well, it was a really good story for a while, but then they realized that there were also surviving tortoises um, on the island that were doing the same thing, and they were likely able to disperse the seeds as well. So they kind of threw that whole thing that the tree needed the dodo sur to survive. I'm sure that, um, you know, there still aren't as many trees around if there would, would be if there were more dodo birds, but there probably are fewer sea turtles as well. So here they are feasting on those. And this is what the seeds actually look like. It's interesting, I was reading a really cool story about, um, what is that Moroccan oil everybody uses for everything, their hair, and you can eat it, and it's absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. At, Oh my goodness, how come I can't remember it? Uh, anyway, goats start eating the seeds of this tree. What the heck is the name of it? Aragon, Aragon oil? And the goats will eat the, the seeds of this tree and pass it through and that helps the people process the seeds. So the ones that are the goats are pooping out are not going to be the ones that you're eating, but they can be used in hair stuff and skin stuff and um, so again, you know, animals will help process these seeds. It's a cute little guy that could be dinner. And some delicious fruit that could also be dinner for them. So here's a dodo and it's gizzard stone, a rather large gizzard stone from 1605. I think a little, again, exaggerated. But again, that's what pigeons do. So, and turkey, so why wouldn't this guy do it? such a pretty, pretty watercolor etching thingy. So why the dodo bird is extinct. This is an incredible book for kids. I wonder why the dodo is dead and other questions about extinct and endangered animals. And I do need to buy this one of these days. And this is one of the beautiful illustrations from it. Sad, but beautiful. I mean, you know, again, it's pretty obvious. It all falls on us. The, the Dutch arrived. They came on shore, they brought with them rats, they brought with them dogs, they brought pigs, and, um, and here's this poor flightless bird, uh, and they're hungry, so they're going to start killing them and probably eating their eggs too, and the, the birds are not afraid of people, so they were just lambs to slaughter. Just an illustration, an old illustration of somebody just walking around clubbing them. Lots of lots of illustrations like this. And then of course the introduction of dogs, cats, pigs, monkeys, rats. I mean the the flora and fauna didn't even have a chance. Sheep, of course, who are just such violators of vegetation. They, they will eat everything right down to the ground, tromp everything with their feet. And it's interesting because I did the Easter Island program for you, Nancy, right? I did the Easter Island, yeah. And it's the same thing. They unleash sheep and just everything, horses, sheep, anything with hooves, just the only thing that you can really have that's soft on vegetation are the, the feet of llamas and camels. They're all padded on the bottom. But here they are in art. Oh, I think I have this twice in here. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, drunk is the Dutch word for dodo bird. These are some of the most important images of the dodo from 1601 in Gelderland. Dutch. Um, this is probably the most 
famous painting of a dodo ever created, Edwards Rowland Savory's painting. It shows a great many features that have become entrenched in the images of the birds, including the prominent bill ridges uh, and shaggy wings and the curly tail and the short legs. The painting is large and it shows the bird as larger than life size. And this, of course, is rather new. Take on Roland Savory's painting. This is a 1602. I love this is so pretty. This actually makes this bird look beautiful and attractive. 1602. They believe that this one was um, almost certainly based on a taxidermy specimen. This is incredible. This is in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. 2010 dodos on sweet. I think they look like um, chess pieces. So this is 17th century, um, previously unpublished illustration of a dodo. And um, it was sold at Christie's for 44,450 pounds. So that's probably over $50,000. Black chalk watercolor brown wash. Uh, it's 10 inches by about eight and a half inches. Eighteen forty four. By a man named Gervais, the Drunk de Ile Maurice, the, the Dodo of Mauritius. Very pretty. And this is the flying dodo <laughs> by Irina. It's again in, in, in popular and modern day art. There, I mean, it's just they're everywhere in some of the craziest things. It's, I mean, this bird truly was immortalized, and you know, it really stamped its itself as something hugely important. It's funny, a lot of this stuff is all with them flying, <laughs> from trying to flying away from people using different ways, balloons and whatnot. The Dodo is a fictional character in chapters two and three of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll, 1865. Um, his name, his real name was Charles Lutwidge Dodgson. And the dodo is a character of the a caricature of the author. This is really cool. I just learned this popular but unsubstantiated belief that Dodgson chose the particular animal to represent himself because he had a stammer and thus would accidentally introduce himself as do, do, Dodgson. So dodo Dodgson. I'll buy that. I think that's a pretty cool story. But of course, how many different um, artistic interpretations of Alice in Wonderland are there? And this is one of my favorites, Arthur Rackham. He's one of my favorite illustrators. This is 1907, crazy about Rackham. I mean, this is obviously Russian, really beautiful. I have no idea what it says, but it's great. And I have no idea where I found it. It's like, oh, that's gorgeous. These are more Alice. Now here's a dodo swimming, something I don't think it was capable of doing at all. Love Day Funk is the artist in this one, Flight of the Dodo. Funny, I had a book in my home when I was a child that I wish I could find it. I don't even know it could still be there, but it was an old zoology book and it actually had a plate with a dodo in it that I just looked online today and somebody was selling a print for almost $500. So I, 
I wish I could find that. I'm not so sure if it's something that just got tossed away. That I remember the book being in very poor condition, but as a child looking at it and knowing that this bird was extinct and here was a book that actually, you know, had it in there. It was probably from the early 1800s. So this is a painting of a white dodo by Peter Withus. It's 1680. And it depicts a white dodo in a park among accurately painted waterfowl. So that's why they believe that this bird really existed. But look at the bill. They think that they clipped the um, hook off of its bill so that maybe the zookeepers or whoever was keeping the waterfall wouldn't get hurt by it. And here's another white dodo. So some scientists believe that Reunion um, Island, there was a white dodo, actually was an immature common dodo, or maybe even a color morph to it. But it does, it does occasionally appear in, in paintings. They believe that some, uh, maybe some young dodos had been taken to Reunion from Mauritius by sailors but no dodo bones have ever been found on the island. Paintings of white dodos are generally used to illustrate articles on the Reunion Solitaire, which is interesting, although this may be just a great an error since the bird is currently believed to be a, a type of ibis, the, the solitaire. D for the dodo, no more we shall meet. See his hooked bill and his short wings and feet. Some new interpretation. This is so gorgeous. Um, this is a painting by Ustad Mansur, and it was stolen from India and taken to Persia in the 1700s and brought to international attention by Alexander Ivanov after he noticed it in an exhibition of Indian and Persian art at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg in 1955. Stunning. I have no idea where you get this from, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> so in popular culture, we once again um, will visit, this painting has, I took this, of. Uh, in Paris, and we'll talk a little bit about why he's uh, painted on a building in Paris. But this is really beautiful. Um, the University of Otago in New Zealand, a professor, Phil Seddon, um, worked with the United Nations and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature to um, create this series of posters about places like travel posters. And on each of these travel posters, there's one for the thylacine, there's one for the passenger pigeon, and obviously for the dodo about um, go and see these animals. Oh, that's right. Oops, we can't anymore. So it's kind of like a Jurassic Park take on get to Mauritius. You can meet the dodo, their friendliest resident. So when I went to Paris, I, I, whenever I travel, I go to I go to natural history museums, and of course, Europe has tons of them. And I knew about the extinct species hall at, in Paris at the natural history museum, but I also know knew about the dodo manege. And I wanted I was going to go a ride on this, and it is a leave it to the French. God, I love them. It is a carousel of extinct species. Nancy, I was flipping out. I couldn't wait to sit on that thylacine or that dodo. So the thylacine is right behind the dodo. And I don't know who these guys are. And then there are some gorillas and other things there. But I specifically wanted to take a ride on this carousel. And I walked up to the um, I walked up to the, the little window and I asked the man for two tickets for my friend Liz and myself. And he's like, no, you can't go. It's only for children. It's like, what do you mean it's only for children? This is a gigantic carousel. It's a big carousel. He's like, no, only for children. You can buy an ice cream. <laughs> and he wouldn't let me on. So I had to watch this kid take my seat. <laughs> Not that I could have, I would have stood near it. I was like, can I just stand? There, I mean, certainly I could have been writing the thylacine 
and he wouldn't let me on. I'm not done with him. <laughs> I'm going back there and I am going to get a ride on this absolutely gorgeous carousel. Where else in the world can you ride a carousel that is dedicated to extinct species? So of course, Errol Fuller lives in England and I got home and I was like, Errol, look at this. He didn't even know about this carousel. I bet they wouldn't have let Errol ride it either. I was fit to be tied, absolutely fit to be tied. Cigarettes, stamps as rare as the dodo depicting Marisha's post office one penny and its famous flightless bird. Always in the background, someone clubbing the poor thing. This is an incredible book on, um, I think, uh, epitaphs or obituaries. Dead as a dodo. I should really buy that. I like that book. You may be next, croaks the dodo to your auto. You better get that oil change. Nancy, get that oil change. I had trouble finding a date as well. It's a jungle out there. We're the last dodos on the planet, so I've put all of our eggs safely into this basket. And even music written about them when the dodo bird is singing in the Coca-Cola tree. I, I was hoping I'd find this song on YouTube, but it's not there. Obviously, it's very, very old. Kevin Muxlow, you crazy son of a gun. How the heck are you, man? I thought you were extinct. You can even make pancakes. If this bird only knew, or maybe get a nice tattoo. Is a convenience store in Mauritius, the Dodo supermarket. Meet the last dodo, $10. I'm doomed anyway, so I might as well make the most of it. So the Brasseries de Bourbon is the only major producer of beer in Reunion Island, formerly known as Bourbon Island, a French overseas department in the Indian Ocean. Um, now it is a part of the Heineken Company. And of course, the dodo is their logo. But it's interesting in their print ads, it's always white dodos. Interesting. What did he ever dodo to you? World Wildlife Fund using the dodo as a poster child. And um, partnering with Lifesavers to help raise awareness to endangered and extinct species. So the dodo is the most famous animal extinction in human history. Just look at it. I was on Etsy today, pages upon pages of dodo stuff that you could buy. And with its death came the realization that humans have the ability to extinguish an entire species. Ironically, once a dodo was declared extinct, there was a surge of dodo research lasting for more than 150 years. And it always happens this way. It's like, oh, let's save them now. And then two years later, they become extinct. It's always, it's always too little, too late. The dodo used to walk around and take the sun and air. The sun yet warms his native ground. The dodo is not there. The voice which is used to squawk and squeak is now forever dumb. Yet may you see his bones and beak all in the museum. Hilary Bellick. Bad Child's Book of Beasts, 1896. So he's gone forever. Only bits and bobs of him remain. And all of our fantasies and fairy tales and all we're left with is just hardly anything from this animal. But he's not around anymore, so we can only you know, try to raise awareness. And yeah, I, I always think that I would love to do this series for children. Um, I think, you know, my success as a, um, as a speaker about bats is that I, I never, and, I, and children being my primary audience, I never speak down to kids. I think kids like to be treated like adults and I don't care whether they're really little kids or big kids, they wanna be treated equally. And I think that's why I have such a connection with children. And I thought, well, this is, this is tough stuff, um, but it's no tougher 
than seeing photographs of bats with white nose syndrome and kids handle it really well. And of course, the way you start children on a path of responsible behavior of, you know, to all living things is, is starting them young. And that's why I would love to maybe make this more of a children's series someday and hopefully uh, I'll be able to, to sell this to, to kids and the teachers and kids in the future because uh, it's such an important topic. And I, I mean, I'm 64 and I think about it all the time. I think about these animals all the time. Um, it's so thought provoking. I was just speaking to Carrie Schved today, my, my colleague here at White Memorial, the education director. And there was this, just this one period, save the dodo, which was a long time ago, but there was this one period from like the late 1700s, let's just say 1800, 1800 up until almost 1950, where we were just completely oblivious, completely oblivious. I mean, all the way from the, you know, the great off, um, all the way up through when we finally stopped using DDT and just stopped the, the what was almost the inevitable extinction of our birds of prey when we were using this chemical, we were just slashing and burning, slashing and burning, killing, beating, chemicals, blah, 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 blah. And then finally, you know, I don't know if we can um, credit uh, Rachel Carson um, with, the, with saving so many species, but we keep on finding species. There was a new bat species just discovered in, uh, I think it was in Namibia in Africa just a couple of months ago, but things become extinct before we even know about them. But we certainly knew about the dodo bird and you know all the other animals that I'm doing these presentations and it could go on and on and on. So I hope you come and visit me, Nancy, at my house someday and see my extinct species bathroom that I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> some old prints and a thylacine shower curtain and you know again I am I am so invested in this hook line and sinker I just uh really really it's such an important topic for all of us I hope you I hope you enjoyed this one tonight thank you so much I really uh I really learned a lot thank you very very much they, they, they get better they get better and better because we know much more about the next animals so but the dodo is just so so little so little known about it absolutely fascinating anybody have any questions you can uh, unmute yourself or you can put them in the chat can you just jerry tell me again um when they were declared extinct? Uh, 1598, 1662, 1662. So from 1598 to 1662, gone. And of course, you know, we knew that there were billions of passenger pigeons. Um, we don't know how many of these birds there were, again, because they were so big, they occupied certain territories there probably weren't that many to begin with and just poof gone i'm actually surprised it took 100 years or 75 years or however long it took to to do that to them because um you know just they were sitting they were sitting ducks mm. yeah yes and get no no shreds of evidence at all how difficult it is to find any kind of evidence, you know, of them. I don't know what they did till after they ate all of them or boiled all of them, what they did with their bones and that there's so little skeletal evidence. And, and that's what is so fascinating to me that, that they didn't, people didn't even believe that they existed. It just happened so fast and there were no records of anything. Do, do you know when the volcano was? Um, oh, oh, the volcano, all the volcanic activity appeared to have happened long before that island was occupied. So it's a volcanic island, but a volcano, I don't think that there's been a volcanic eruption in modern time, and that includes the period of the dodo. Oh. I never read anything about any kind of eruption, but it is a volcanic island. It is, it's total lava, but there are lots of islands, you know, you know, like that. Um, do you, I have a question, do uh -huh. you, 
do you have any idea since where the the dodo i mean how did it happen to come onto this island if it couldn't fly yeah they they think that it just kind of blew in possibly or po it might have been a flighted bird and then when it landed it got up there by mistake somehow maybe a wind blew it out and then because it had no predators its wings just kind of de-evolved they didn't need them for anything there was no need for them to fly there was an abundance of food and this was a great place for them to you know just set up shop. And so that's how they believe they got there through like a trade wind or something. So they must have been flighted at some point because they certainly didn't have webbed feet. Right, right. And and similar to, you know, when we have tropical storms and hurricanes where sometimes even nor'easters where they pick up, you know, birds, fish, whatever, and they fly around and suddenly something lands in New England. I think there was some bird that recently, wasn't there, Nancy, that there was, was I can't remember what it was, but there, there was, was a roseate spoonbill. Right, that's right. A, that's what yep. it was. Thank that you. was moving yeah. up and down the East Coast and these birders were all going crazy. Um, yeah, and that happens. This is really funny. I'm also a traffic reporter. And when I first started reporting, I've been a, a traffic reporter for um, 25 years or 22 years or something. And I was just beginning in the industry and it was the week after Christmas and there's nothing happening. And up at Bradley Airport, a brown pelican lands. What? It was a brown pelican up at Bradley Airport and it's all I talked about during my traffic reports. It was like the only thing to talk, there was no traffic. It's like, oh my God, there's a brown pelican up at Bradley Airport. Isn't that crazy? And again, it must've been one of those storms. Um, yeah. this, past, this past summer, a, a bat blew into Iceland and it might've come in on an airplane. It could've come in on a jet. And it was hard, a friend of mine who's a bi biologist up there sent me a picture of it and the poor little thing was like all wet and, you know, dead and, and whatnot. And it looked like it could have been our species, a big brown bat, but it could have come from Europe because they have similar species. So obviously airplanes weren't going to bring the dodo bird to Mauritius, but um, yeah, things, uh, small things like bats can travel in airplanes. And also there are bats that actually blow into Iceland from Europe. Again, you know, hoary bats from Europe will actually end up in Iceland mm -hmm. and we'll find them maybe once a year, once every couple of years. So it does happen. We have these big weather events and it just changes everything. The snowy owls, there was just one, um, I saw a photograph of one, I think down probably in Milford or somewhere in your area. Uh, a, a young one, you know, there's not enough food up north. They start, the young start leaving the nest. They're looking for territory and they end up down here. Oh yeah, we get snowy owls quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Quite a bit. yeah. So that spoonbill was great because they, they were tracking it for, I think a couple of months anyway. And of course, I don't know if you know anything about birders, they're maniacs. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and they will do anything to get that picture or just have that sighting just put that in my life list <laughs> yeah <laughs> so just as we see that happen today it happened centuries ago as well mm -hmm. and so you're going to be talking about the great auk next time is that right is that what we're doing next the great auk i think so yeah i think so i try to do these in chronological order um, I think I might do the thylacine after the great auk because there, there are three birds and one mammal and I'd like to kind of break it up um, and put a mammal in there. So the thylacine actually became extinct after the passenger pigeon, but I pop him in as number three. And then we end up uh, with the passenger pigeon at the end. And um, I will show you our passenger pigeon mount um, as part of that, that presentation. I don't have a thylacine, a dodo skull, or a dodo bone, or a great auk egg. I was hoping I'd find a great auk egg upstairs in our egg collection, but I found a picture of one, and that was pretty cool, <laughs> but not an egg. So, you know, it's interesting uh, with all of these animals, and with things in general, when they're gone, then all of a sudden we start collecting taxidermy, and we start collecting eggs, and we start collecting any little bit and bob of them that we can get our, our paws on. It's like, oh, it's gone now. These things are extremely valuable. Like that, even that etching for that painting that went for over $50,000. So. 
Well, we look forward to the next one. And you folks who came tonight, be sure to tell your friends because um, we will be doing this series for four months. And um, uh, I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot. Thank, Thank you Nancy. very much. Thank you always for your support. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And I look forward to talking to you about the great off coming up. Thanks. Thank you. Stay well. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks for Bye -bye. coming.